Okay, hi everybody. I'm Eric Sanderson from the Wildlife Conservation Society, and uh, we've been using Google Earth Engine to map the human footprint on a global scale, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, these are this is our team of human footprinters um, uh, from the Wildlife Conservation Society, from Spark Geo, uh, from Panthera, and the Nature Conservancy. Um, and you know, we all do this work because we love nature so much, and we want nature to to persist into the future in the ways that we've come to understand it. Um, and that's why it takes it, it goes right to our hearts when you see such destruction that's going on in our world today. For example, with Chris John and this, this elephant here. Um, and we know in general that what's driving this is, is human population and our consumption and our demand for uh, resources that's um, leading to natural resource extraction all over the world. Um, and you know the expansion of human infrastructure, but but and we we know this in a sort of general sense. But how do we actually think about what it means for a species like the tiger, or for that matter, what does it mean for a species like us, like me and my family? I mean, how how do you actually grasp this at a global scale? Um, that's what we try to do through this human footprint mapping. Um, we try to take together data about where people live, about human infrastructure. Um, about human activities and access, and then from the nighttime lights that you can see on a, on a satellite. Um, so I'll just show you some of these maps. So these, these maps all don't have any country boundaries, don't have any oceans, they're just the data themselves, human population density, uh, human settlements on a global scale, human land use, urban and cropland land uses, um, the road network of the world, um, and then the stable lights data set, which is also famous now, used in the movies all the time. Um, so what we do in the human footprint is we add these up. Oops. We add them up and give them a standardized scoring so you can work across units. And the idea is to try and map the gradient of human influence from places that are more influenced by people, like, I don't know, say downtown Chicago, to places that are least influenced uh, by human beings. And to do this in a standardized way all around the world. Um, and what's when we first did this, this was back in 2002, the data was at one kilometer resolution. So you can really see patterns of Eastern North America and compare it to um, Central South America. By the way, these two maps are at similar scales, and so you can really see um, how big South America is. Um, and the effect that road or rivers, in the case of South America, are modes of access for human beings. Um, and you can really drill in, and I can like show this to my mom, and she can identify towns and roads and and cities, uh, parks, um, and so forth. You know, like I live in New York City, and you can see the the New York Thruway, and you can see the Adirondack Mountains, and you can see Montreal and Quebec, um, and you can see the the wilds of Quebec and, and Ottawa. So, and then you can use this map to map wild places, the more intact places all around the world, and do it in a biome-specific way. And this is the kind of information that's feeding the simultaneous conversations that are going on this week and in Montreal around the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, so we, we had this paper come out in, in 2002, um, and subsequently it's been cited over 3,500 3, times in the literature, um, partly as data. We made the data open source and available, so people have used it to map invasive species, to uh, measure the resistance of ecosystems to climate change, to drive species distribution models, so forth and so on. But it's also a way of communicating, like this idea of like, how do we think about how human beings are impacting the globe on a worldwide scale um, in a way that you can actually trace down to neighborhoods and, and reasons that you realize? So it gets cited in papers about the domestication of the earth and what does it mean to be a wild place and how are indigenous and non-indigenous cultures changing the world differently or what is the definition of the Anthropocene or what is the bottleneck and the breakthrough? What is going to be the future of human influence over the next hundred years? Um, and then finally, this work has been kind of a go to do better human footprint mapping all around the world at the national scale, at regional scales. So there's something called the Human Modification Index, which leans very heavily on the human footprint, but mixes them together, or, or machine learning techniques, or future projections. So uh, in 2016, some colleagues and I published a, a change analysis where we had two time points, uh, 19, kind of 1995 and two, 2009. And then, you know, you can actually see where is the human footprint changing on the world and how is it changing um, in different biomes of the world. Um, and the big um, headline indicator from this is that the 
worldwide human footprint changed about 9% between 1993 and 2009. Um, but over that same period, the, the global population grew 23% and the economy grew 153%. So even though human footprint is ultimately driven by population and economic activity, it's not keeping up with um, these other trends. And so maybe there's something hopeful in that. Um, and so uh, we were thinking about these thoughts when um, in 2017, I went to Geo for Good at, at Google for the first time, and I was learning about Google Earth Engine, and I thought, oh my God, this is how we do it, not just once or twice, but every year into perpetuity, um, using the Google Earth Engine, which is, you know, for those of you who want to learn, there's people here that know more about it than I do, but such an extraordinary platform for planetary computing because it provides these global data sets, it provides a, a geospatial network that's on the Google Cloud that allows you to distribute these operations on a global scale, and then it produces online assets that you can immediately build into, into websites and other kinds of um, activities. So, so when we did Human Footprint 1, we had a series of data sets, and I can talk to you more about the individual ones, and then in Human Footprint 2, we picked some of these. Some of them were a dynamic, because they were changing over time, but others, like the roads data, were static, because that was what the world had. We didn't have a changing roads data set um, until recently with um, some new new innovations. So you see all the acronyms have changed here. That's because there's been a lot of work on these individual layers. And now with Google Earth Engine, we're able to map them on an annual scale going forward. Um, so these are continuous time points where everything is changing. They're better resolved, the more dynamic. So in particular, we're using OpenStreetMap now to map infrastructure and roads. And we're using the higher resolution VIRS data that NASA is producing to deal with the stable lights. And the idea is to build a mapping system that we can both you know, make corrections in the past, but also advance future versions of this into the future. Um, and really the, the big thing here is OpenStreetMap, which has really broken up the ability for all of us to see the infrastructure um, and how it's changed over time on a global scale. Um, and we've done extensive validation using Google Earth Pro where we look at you know, uh, images with different human footprints over specific signatures to validate the results. And in general, the validation has gone, gone very well. Um, so let me just show you what the results look like by jumping over to this website here. Um, so if you go to this website, it's wcshumanfootprint.org. You can go to a map, um, and this will load, and you can see how the human footprint is changing over time. So this is the human footprint, and you can, um, of course, zoom in. Oops. Well, if I was better at this, I could zoom in. You can see this graph of how it's changing. You can also choose any country in the world. You can choose, I don't know, what's going on in Albania, and it will zoom to Albania and show you how the human footprint's changing, and then also show you how the human footprint is changing in Albania on the graph here. We've also built some um, cool Earth Engine apps allow you to pick two time points. So this is 2001 on the left and 2020 on the right. And you can zoom back and forth and see how the human footprint is changing on a global scale. So here we're going forward in time, and now we're going backward in time. You can zoom around anywhere. Again, this is only possible because of the, the Google Earth Engine platform that's underneath it. You can also look at the individual drivers the roads, the infrastructure, the land use, the power, the railways, the navigable waters, the population density, and zoom in. Um, and then finally, if you go to the website, I just want to point out that if you go uh, back home here and to that data access page, um, there are all the code is open source. You can read the GitHub. So if you don't like the way we've mapped the human footprint, you can download our code, modify it, and make your own human footprint. The Earth Engine assets are here. And then there's also TIFFs. If you're if you're not in the Earth Engine world yet, um, but you want to work with TIFFs and some other process, then then those are all available to you there. And this is all open source, and I encourage you to to have a look at it. Um, so I'm just going to go back to our slides here, um, just to show you, just to make a few quick comments about the trends. So one thing is when we add in OSM and VIRS, those are the red dots you see there. It really changes the trajectory of human influence. And that's because we were missing a lot in the past data layers. So you can see the past, if we just use the old technique, that's the blue. 
Um, but if you add in the new data, there's just so many more roads and infrastructure that weren't in the global data sets before. And that that's that in itself is a really important result for, I think, almost everything that we're talking about in this conference. Um, also, the variation goes up. And also, what are the drivers of human influence go up? What, what are the most important factors under the human footprint uh, change um, there? And if you want to read more about this, uh, we have a preprint version. This is in review right now, uh, the March of the Human Footprint. If you just Google that, you'll find it. Um, I want to say, too, that for me, this has been a, a big advance in the way to think about how to do this kind of thing. I think we're really going from beyond making a map to making mapping systems, right? Where, you know, there's a well-defined set of inputs. There's a whole series of tasks and task infrastructures, in our case, using Google Earth Engine, that produce a well-defined output. And what's valuable about this is that you can go in and um, change one of the inputs. If you get a better input or you get the input for next year, then you can just rerun the process. And now you have next year's output. You can, you can make incremental improvements. And also you can adapt the system over time so that that can change. And so um, really, we kind of think about this as publishing the system for mapping the human footprint as much as it is about the human footprint itself. And Earth Engine is really the mechanism that allows us to do that. Oops. Okay, let me go forward a little bit more there. So um, I gave a talk yesterday about how we're using this data to build a new a near real-time monitoring system for tiger conservation. It's been funded by NASA. Um, we have another website there, which you can check out and um, see the maps and see how uh, what we call tiger conservation, oops, tiger conservation landscapes are changing over time. Um, on a range-wide scale, oops, this might take a minute to load. But anyway, you, if you have a chance, you get to look at it. Again, the data sets all are, are downloadable. And this is really driving countries to think about how they can work together to conserve tigers. And actually, it seems like tigers seem to have turned a, have turned a quarter. Um, oops, let me just go back to my slides here. Um, and we're now extending that work from the tigers on to jaguars, to bison, and to lions. And we're hopeful to do very many species going forward. Um, so, you know, this human footprint has been used by literally thousands of scientists around the world to do different kinds of analyses. I would love to talk to any of you about what you would like to do with it, and uh, we'd be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. So the question was, has there any thought to take the time series further back in time? Yeah, we've talked about that. We just don't have the, the same data. Yeah, yeah. You know, the problem with the, all these kind of systematic claims is that as the data sets change over time, yeah. then you get these discontinuities and then what to make of the discontinuities, right? Um, but, you know, um, in, in some ways we've been trying to explore the, the high data set, you know, the high data set of how um, historically ecosystems have changed. And that data goes back 10,000 years. It's really an extraordinary thing. It's, it's at a completely different resolution. It's like 50 kilometer cells, um, but it's the same kind of drivers, land use and population over time. And so um, we have a paper that's coming out about the indigenous range of the tiger. And we use that data set to try and uh, estimate when human beings first influenced tigers all across the range. And for places like India and China, it was, you know, 5,000 years ago was the first time. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, what are some of the barriers to scaling to more and more species? Well, I have to say the biggest barrier is actually in the conservation community, and it's sharing the species observation information. So there, you know, there are amazing things like Wildlife Insights, which is, you know, this great camera trap database. But if you actually look how many observations are for tigers, it's very, very few. It's not enough to drive the model. Um, uh, as I spoke yesterday for the tiger work, we had to do a systematic review of the literature where we basically read every paper that's been written about tigers over the last 25 years, and, you know, literally had to digitize people's maps because we couldn't get them to share the data with us. Um, in the end, we got over 100,000 points to drive the models, but, you know, that's not really a replicable model. So something I'm working with with some of my NASA colleagues is to try and, and my conservation college, is to try and get, us, get people to get in the mode of sharing their data so that, you know, so that it's not just for your own paper, but it actually can actually last and have application at the range-wide scale. So, um, yeah, so um, the question was, is the TCL work being used by national and local NGOs? And, and yes, it's, a, it's actually been a collaborative effort between all the 
the big NGOs that work on tigers, the WCS, WWF, the IUCN Cat Specialist Group, um, Flora and Fauna International. And then we've we've worked with individual countries, so Thailand, Bhutan, some of the other countries have contributed data. Um, but you know, the way these things kind of work is like you make the map, you show people the map and they complain about it. And you say, well, how can I make that better? And like, well, there is this other data set. And then you put that data set in. And in the past, you know, that was a big deal to like then rerun. But now it's actually just a couple hours, right? With Earth Engine, you can like, you know, literally change a few time, a few data points in Thailand or something, and then recompute the 20 year time series. So that's a big advance. That's a big difference. Um, and we're actually going to be going to Asia in, in the springtime to talk to countries about it and have those conversations with them. The question was um, earlier I showed that the human footprint, the rate of increase isn't keeping up directly with population density. And the question was whether we've done any sensitivity tests to see if, like, you know, a whole bunch of things you could change. You could change different weightings. You could change the way you do the different classifications. Um, and you could you can change in different parts of the world too. Like if you read that paper from 2016, you'll see that there are some countries where the rate of human influence has actually gone down a little bit over that period between 1993 and 2009. And we we did some analyses about why that is. Why are some countries having more of human footprint? Why are some less? And the the factors are kind of surprising. So control of corruption is one. Um, another was urbanization. Actually, urbanization is associated with a, de a slight decrease in human footprint across the countries of the world. Um, and the third one had to do with the trade balance, which you can imagine, right? All the stuff about, you know, extra source consumption and how the over the rising consumption is affecting conservation, you know, far beyond here. And the way that all of us, even though we don't really think about it, are influencing tigers right now by what we had for dinner last night, right? Um, but it's so hard to like be able to quantify those, those sort of relationships. But I think this human footprint data provides a mechanism to start to think about those questions.